Hello again, it's the Ohio Ram Show coming to you not from Southwest Ohio, as it usually is, but in Central Ohio, where we are in Dublin, and we're here to do some show with the Ram Challenge, the Ohio version of that, one of seven Ram Challenges. And uh, the Ohio Ram Show is sponsored by the Time Stations at Oxford and Blanchester, Ohio, in the race across America. But sometimes we do other things uh, in the way of uh, cycling and ultra cycling, and this is one of them. Hello, I'm Lee Kreider. I'm the host of the show. And we'll be talking to uh, the Bothlings, who are here today, the owners of the Race Across America, and a number of the other participants as they show up. And enjoy the show. We're here today with Rick uh, Bothling, who is... Uh, executive director, is that right? I am the executive director, yes. Of the Race Across America. The Race Across America, Race Across the West, and every other package of event we get. <laughs> and you're quite a world traveler. You were just in Italy? I was over in Italy. Uh, we had a new qualifying race over there called Dolomitica, and I went over there to watch the race and kind of help out and participate in production there, and it was fantastic. So uh, we're here in Dublin, Ohio, and uh, tell us a little bit about what we're here for. So we run a handful of events called the Ram Challenge Series, and they're based around 200-mile and 400-mile races. Um, the 200-mile we can do supported and unsupported versions, and the 400-mile we do, uh, they're all supported by a crew. They're Ram qualifiers, so they're designed to simulate small versions of Ram, and that's what we're here to put on. Okay, and um, now this show will probably air after that, but... Um I understand that uh, you and, and Fred and a couple other people are going to be doing uh, Dex Took's No Country for Old Men this year. Right. So the, my family, Fred, and uh, my brother-in-law, Chad, and myself used to race quite a bit as a team, um, adventure racing, bicycle racing, and we took a few years off. And it's turned out that Dex's event fell at a pretty good timing for us because we were headed to Florida. And we decided, you know, why don't we start racing again? So it's John Ryling who works for us as a race director on some of the events. And then Chad, Fred, and I uh, were racing a four-man relay in his 383-mile event. And um, Dex puts on a good show, so it should be really fun. Well, there's only one Dex took. There is only one Dex took, and I only hope we can live up to Dex's aura that he has painted for everyone out there. <laughs> he, he keeps advertising his race. What is it? Are you rugged enough for this? Yeah, are you rugged enough? But if you've ever been to West Texas and bidden out there and ridden, you'd understand what he's talking about. It is some remote, remote country, but super spectacular high desert. And you get out to Big Bend National Park. I mean, it, it's a really, really pretty area. And he's put on a thousand mile route this year yeah he he talked to us about it and we you know we went back and forth with him about the qualifying aspects and we said well we'd rather keep your 400 mile of the qualifier but it's up to you we're we'll happy to make the thousand mile qualifier and he said well let me just run it and see how it goes i think he got more people than he thought he would get I, it's great we need we really need another thousand mile race i mean raw is 860 so we need you know we need a couple events that distance it's great and because there's people watch this, believe it or not, who n never heard of this, Raw is the Race Across the West. Raw is Race Across the West, so it follows the exact same route as Race Across America. It just ends in Durango. Um, so both solos and teams all start with the solo Ram racers. So it's a really good way to experience the first third of Ram and get to see what these solo racers are actually putting in to get out there, what they're like when they're racing. It's a, it's a really good experience to to see if RAM is where you want to end up. Well, let's talk a little more about um, the, um, the uh, event here. How many people have you got enrolled, do you know? So I think we have six solo riders in the 400, and then we have, I believe, 13 riding the 200 solo, and then a couple two-person teams. And, you know, ultimately what we'd like to see are more teams come out and participate. Solos, it's good, and it's good practice. It's good training ground, again, to kind of work your way through the distance of the sport. But we'd like to see even more Ram teams come out and kind of cut their teeth on some of these shorter events um, so they get a little experience of working with a crew, what it's like to actually be on the road and have people with you doing most everything but riding the bike. Yeah, and, uh, you know, I was one of those piece, people, Rick, that when, uh, I don't know when teams first started, but I said, this isn't right, you know, this isn't, but 
uh, it's turned out to be a real great thing, hasn't it? Team racing is really a really cool thing. And what it is, it started really in, in earnest in 1992. And what it has really done is it's opened up the sport. For, because there's only so many people in this world that are going to want to ride solo ram. There's only so many people are going to want to ride solo 400 miles. And so what it's allowed is a lot of people that think they might want to do it or they want to try something a little different or something that pushes them a little beyond a traditional Ironman or something like that um, and then go out and experience it and see if they like it. And oddly enough, we get a fair amount of solo racers that kind of work their way through the ranks. So they might start, start on a four or eight person team, do that once or twice, move to a two person team and then move to solo. So, well, yeah, a lot of traditionalists go, Oh, team racing, it's not Ram. It's just different Ram. And it does actually turn out quite a few solo racers. And I know, uh, when I talked to Janice Schufelt, who won the women's division this year, um, after some, challenging experiences i might say um she did it on a two-person mixed team the year before and that was exactly her purpose to get the feel of what it was all about uh in preparation for doing a solo yeah absolutely and i and and joel's in the same boat so joel obviously in right. the endurance world is well known he is a super talented bicycle racer and he's done so many two-person records, he's finally gotten to a point where he's thinking about solo. But having so many two-person teams under his belt, he's going to go in really well prepared. Uh, my dad, Fred, followed the same route. He officiated, rode a two-person team, raced solo. And he'll tell you that, you know, had he not done that process, he would have had a much more difficult time finishing as a solo racer. It, it just allows you to experience things and see things that you can't just get by riding your bike by yourself. Yeah, and um, I have to say that, uh, as we've said at the beginning of the show, that we're sponsored here by the two first two time stations, Ohio, mm -hmm. at Oxford and Blanchester. Uh, they're the reasons why we're here. They started this all. But um, one of the nice things about here in Ohio, Rick, is we're at a very good place to see the race because at about this location, the teams are catching up with the solo riders, so even though you'll have a day at the beginning and a day at the end where there's not much happening, there's about three days in the center there where you can come to our time stations any time of the day or night, and there'll be things going on. Yeah, you guys, you guys are located perfectly, and you do a fantastic job, by the way, with your time stations. Um, your time stations in Congress and, and um, Joe in uh, Washington, Missouri are some of the best on the course. And, you know, when people ask us, what, you know, what does a time station look like, what does it feel like, you're the people we direct them to and say, look, you want to see what it looks like? This is what it should look like. And you're right. At the point in the course where you get, not only do you get them kind of merging into one, they're kind of consistently coming through. And you get to see at that point kind of the good, the bad, and the ugly with it all, too. Um, you, you kind of got them in all states. Well, before uh, things caused me to limit things, I always worked the night shifts at these time stations. I always told people, you want to see what Ram's all about. You come there at 3 o'clock in the morning when you see people at their best and at their worst. Yeah, the night nighttime is a really interesting time for most people. It's generally the hardest time for people to ride because your body is telling you you should be asleep. And so, yeah, when they're riding through, especially, you know, a couple thousand miles in, they're they're pretty beat up and then they're riding when their body's telling them not to be riding in the middle of the night and you do get kind of an interesting array at that time of day <laughs> now um on the qualifiers the 400 mile is a qualifier here is it not yes it is and tell me what it takes to qualify on the 400 mile so basically the events are set up so that you have to finish the event in the time limit it's a pretty conservative time limit but like i said the biggest thing is it's not that it qualifies you to race 3,000 miles. It, there's nothing that really does that. What it does do is it's 400 miles of working with a crew and understanding you're going to go through some pains and agonies. Your crew is going to have to navigate and understand the roads and how cue sheets work. Our cue sheets are set up just like the Ram Root Book. The time stations are the same as a Ram Root Book. So it's really just practice more than it, it technically qualifies you to race. Um, it qualifies you to understand what you're getting yourself into. And as you said, and so many people have said that there's no way to find out what it's about until you actually do it. 
it's a different thing. Yeah, yeah. There's nothing out there. The, I, you know, the best qualifiers in the world are like race around Austria, race around Ireland, and race across the West. And it's partially because of their distance. They're you know 1,200 miles, or you know, eight, in the case of raw, 800 miles of the Ram route. But you know, every other qualifier, the difference between 400 miles, 500 miles, a 24-hour race. They don't really prepare you for 3,000, and that's just a reality. And what you really want out of it is practice riding through the night because most normal people don't ride their bikes at night. Um, We have to choose to go do that, and most people don't have the luxury of having a support crew with them when they ride. Speaking of race around Ireland, I I think it was Valerio saying uh, he wondered if they were on the right race this year because they had sunshine and uh, not much wind. Last year it was just pure hell. Well, yes, Ireland for the past few years has been just horrible, rainy Irish weather. And this year they just nailed it perfect. But they moved the event up a couple weeks in the year. Um, which I think got a, got them a little better weather out of it. They had a great field. They had great results. Um, lucky year for them. Now, you do have uh, other events. You mentioned uh, No Country for Old Men that you authenticate, I guess I should say, as qualifying races, and you have them all over the world. You mentioned Italy, and there's others. Yeah, so we have events. We have about, tw- I think it's about 30 events, um, and there's, what we're trying to get is a geographic diversity so that if you want to qualify, there's an event close, closer to you. Some places are difficult, but we do have events in New Zealand that we work with, India that we work with, Germany, I mean, all over Europe, it, two in Switzerland, Italy, England, Ireland. So it, we're really trying to make it accessible for people to race, and we're going to try to get some... We've had, we had a qualifier in Brazil several, six, eight, ten years ago, and we'd like to see one back in South America. Brazil is the best choice for us because that's where most of the racers come from. But, yeah, that's the idea is we want the accessibility to people, for people to race. The more races there are, to some extent, the better because more people have access to them. And I've had a lot of Danes on the show. What is happening in Denmark? They're just Is everybody in Denmark going to ride in the race across America? We're hoping so. I mean, <laughs> but yes, there, there's a perfect example. So there was no qualifier in Denmark for many, many years. And a few years ago, um, they approached us, Leo Jensen said, you know, we'd like to do this Bianchi Melfar 24 hour race. And we said, great. Sounds like a fantastic thing. Put it in as a qualifier. We went from basically zero Danish racers to, I think last year we had 11 or 12 and same thing this year. Yeah, and uh, the other country I notice is producing so many racers is Australia. They're coming there pretty good. Um, you know, kind of the same thing. I mean, it, the qualifier in New Zealand is a relatively new. I mean, the event's been around for a long time, but the qualifier end of it's pretty new. And I think the the accessibility to it, um, they, you know, their economy is pretty strong, with, which helps. But, yeah, I think kind of once people get a taste of it, more and more people get intrigued by it. You know, the, again, the accessibility and access to information helps a lot for us to grow the events. Um, we've actually talked to a couple people about a qualifier in Australia. I could see that happening in the next year to two years. So, Okay, well, listen, Rick, I am keeping you from doing some important stuff, getting set up over here. So uh, thank you very much for being with us. We appreciate all you do uh, and uh, keeping the race across America alive. Uh, just one more question. When did you and your dad take this over? So we took over Ram the January 1 of 2007. So 2007 was the first event we put on. He raced in 2005 and 06. Then we took over the race and it has, it, we kind of bought it thinking we could do it as a part-time thing. Uh, Realized that that didn't really work. So now it is actually our full-time job and we do this all year round. And uh, you know, it's people like you and the folks down in Oxford and Blanchester and Congress and, you know, Oceanside and Annapolis that keep us moving. You know, they're the ones that make it available and easier for us to do our jobs and i'd way rather sit here and talk to you than go hang I know, fencing you got to do that, but <laughs> thank you so much and uh, we love the race uh i was talking to jim what your head official over here and i can tell you it's an infection you you say this is the dumbest thing i ever heard of but you can't let go of it you know yeah i, I was having a conversation with a good friend of mine ryan van duzer and i said he said so, he said yeah well racing across america is dumb and he was joking he's done it he did it on an eight-man team and i said ryan a lot of things are dumb but what 
you know, but what do you really remember? You know, you may go do something exactly. like Ram, and it's never, ever, ever going to leave your system. And you can see Yuri Robich talk about it. He goes, it, it's in my blood. I can't, I can't get it out. And, you know, it's the way it works. Yeah, and speaking of Yuri, we just passed an anniversary a few days ago of his death uh, four years ago. How did four years fly by so fast? And um, uh, bless him wherever he is. He was a real contribution to the sport, was he not? He was an absolute consummate champion. Um, I got to know Yuri pretty well. Um, I talked to him. I was in Slovenia a few months before his death, and he was on training camp in Canary Islands. And he called, so I got to talk to him for a little bit. And when we got the news, we were actually at Interbike and devastating. Yeah. We were all just crushed. And, you know, Yuri was a great, great guy, not just on the bike, but off the bike. He, he was, was. He was. And he would stop, of course, when he had plenty of time uh, at the time stations and, and talk to the fans, and that was great. Thanks, Rick. I'm going to let you go. All right. Thank you, Lee. Well, we're here with Fred Bothling, CEO of the Race Across America, right? Yep, that's it. Pleasure to be here with you, Lee. And it's always a pleasure to see you again. I remember you had a really nice time, uh, spent a lot of time with me uh, last spring at a coffee and uh, had a, got a wonderful conversation. Yes, we uh, increased Tim Horton's bottom line. <laughs> Well, Chuck and I meet at Tim Horton's. Uh, Chuck is a videographer here. We'll have him uh, wave a little bit later and uh, introduce him. He's He's been promoted. I said he was my production assistant. I've now made him producer. Ah, uh, well, that's good. There's been no increase in pay. No, no, that's okay. But that's, I understand that, believe me. <laughs> so I uh, talked to, uh, to Rick, your son, for quite a little while about what's going on here, and we're glad to see you. But, uh, so we know pretty much about uh, the challenge, but uh, is there anything new or different happening with the race across America that you see coming in the future? Actually, uh, we're working on a lot of new things, and every year we have 10 or 20 new ideas, and but you can't do them all. But uh, we are going to do probably a half dozen new things this year. We're going to uh, increase the media coverage. We are going to substantially increase the number of officials. Um, there are just a lot of things going on. Some of them I'm not at liberty to tell you right now, but uh, in the future. Well, you had kind of a media bonanza last year, by luck or by design or whatever. Yes. I mean, it, uh, the good thing about it, I, we will say luck to a certain extent, but on the other hand, it's we've worked very hard to raise the profile of the race and uh, that ultimately pays dividends in some very circuitous ways and last year of course we we uh, uh, had Pippa Middleton and our brother James racing on our eight person English team and that resulted in just you know, phenomenal coverage in, in markets that we have really never been in before. So on one hand, yes, we're lucky to have them, but in, on the other hand, uh, I don't think they would have come had they not found out about the race and been following it. So, And I told, uh, when Pippa was on the Today Show, I told John Foote, I says, they couldn't buy that publicity for several million dollars. <laughs> no, that, that's, absolute, that's absolutely true. It's... Uh, it's uh yeah we got we were on the Today Show we were on the uh, Nightline, Nightline and uh, you know all of the the about every magazine you could imagine uh, obviously it had a picture of Pippa out there uh, racing so it was uh, it, it was a publicity bonanza and you know, very good for the race and it's my impression by just looking at your website that your early registration has been quite healthy this year yes. Yes. Uh, last year, last year, 2013, uh, was a rough year because we had, we had to deal with the, the remnants of the presidential election. And um, at the same time, they had problems in, in Europe. And that's a big chunk of our riders come from Europe. So 2013 was a rough year. Uh, 2014 just turned around and put us right back on the growth track again. And it looks like 2014 will be at least as good as 2013, uh, just based on the early registrations. Uh, 20, you mean 2015? Yeah, 2015. I, I have, Fred, I have the same problem. I am um, still writing 2012 on my checks. <laughs> Lee, that's pretty bad. <laughs> Even I've been writing 2014 on my checks. <laughs> well, I don't write many checks anymore, to be truthful, but once in a while. Well, Fred... Uh, 
I know you're very busy here, and I'm not going to uh, take you away from your work. I wouldn't want to do that. But uh, we appreciate the time you're taking to uh, be here and uh, give us this. Ohio, this is probably the nicest time of year to be in Ohio. That, that's, I, I agree with you. It is absolutely the nicest time of year. The leaves are turning. There's hardly a breath of wind. The temperature's perfect. It's been that way for the past several days. I've been out driving the roots and making sure everything's okay. Just unbelievable weather. And it's supposed to be that way through the weekend. So uh, I think the racers are going to have a good time. Well, we hope so. And for any who've not been here to ride before, we don't want, we want to uh, do not disillusion you. There are a hill or two on this route, are there not? <laughs> oh, yes, there are. There are some pretty healthy hills, uh, especially north and east of here. On the 200 route, they've got uh, probably 8,000 feet of climbing. And on the 400 uh, route, out in the Amish country along the eastern uh, edge of Ohio and down into the, the southeast down by Athens, a um, lot of hills down there too, a lot of hills, big ones, up, down, up, down, up, down, really good for the climbers. Well, I've always said that uh, the Appalachian Hills are more defeating than the Rockies because you just got one right after another. Yeah, so usually it's worse than that. In, on Ram, in June, it's 90 degrees outside and 90% humidity, uh, it seems. And um, after you've ridden 2,500 miles and then you get hit with the Appalachians, you know, it's... It's pretty tough. It's the hardest part of Ram, I think. I, when I raced, I certainly thought it was. Well, I haven't raced Ram, but I've ridden across West Virginia, and I can testify to that. I was talking uh, one time to a truck driver when I was riding across there, and he said if they would iron West Virginia out, it'd be as big as Texas. You know, I read that somewhere, too, in, uh, in uh, geography in uh, elementary school. I, I remember that. Yeah, I think you're right. Well, thanks again, Fred. I won't keep it any longer. We always appreciate what you do, and thanks for the race across America and for keeping it alive and the, keeping it going. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I, we love what you're doing too, Lee. So, onward and upward. Well, we enjoy doing it. Thank you. Thank you a lot, Red, yep, Fred. Thank you. Bye. -bye. <laughs> well, we're here with one of the officials. And your name is Jim Harms. Jim Harms, and where are you from, Jim? Tucson, Arizona. And you are? I am the director of officials for the, this conglomeration here. And how long have you been doing this? I've been officiating since 2008 and director of officials for two years now. Okay. And, uh, you know, I was going to ask the both things this. How long have we been doing these challenges? That's a good question. I'm not sure. I want to say maybe three, four years. Okay. And have you officiated then at, um, on the Race Across America? Yes. And you've taken over as head when? Uh, January 1st, 2013. Okay. And before that, remind me, who did it always? Mike Rourke and Rob Warren. Right. I remember the Rourkes. They were always the last people through, and uh, he and his wife were such nice people. And I noticed they were missing this year. Yes, and last year. It was good that they helped out last year in California on RAM. And this year they were traveling. Good for them. Well, you know, I, I guess the I don't see how they could turn down the pace so good. Oh, it's excellent. Who wouldn't want to do it? <laughs> so how many officials you got, uh, Jim? For the, this event or for? For this event. This event I have three officials counting myself. Okay. And so that's, uh, we mentioned them before. Uh, we have uh, Jamie Narragon, we have John Foote, and then we have Nick Madrone, who was a writer last year. Okay, and uh, I know uh, Jamie and John very well. But uh, so um, now, how many, are you going to have some on the 200, some on the 400? How does it work? We'll split up the officials uh, two and two, and then possibly with the heavy 200s um, we have this year, we might pull one more off of the 400s and bring them down to help with the twos. Okay, very good. Well, thanks a lot, Jim. Thank you. Appreciate and good luck out there. Appreciate it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right. Bye. Well, thanks, Rick, and thanks, Fred, and thanks, Jim Harn, for taking time out to talk to me. Uh, they were very, very busy erecting all of the uh, paraphernalia and, uh, for the start and finish line there for the uh, Ram Challenge here in Ohio. It's quite an operation and uh, just uh, 
very few, just the two of them, uh, plus Jim, helped do that. And um, I want to thank Chuck Stiver uh, for coming with me to help me with the video graphing. We appreciate that a great deal. Uh, this was Chuck's first uh, go at something like this, and I kind of twisted his arm, recruited him, and I told him he didn't have to get up at 4 o'clock the next morning to see the start, but he did just the same, and uh, our next show we're going to show you uh, interviews of some of the racers who came there, just uh, general chatting with, with them. And we want to thank all of you for watching the show. Remember that um, you can get information about the show at our website, ohioramshow.com, which you should see on your screen there about now. On that site, you can sign up for email that will get you notifications of uh, shows that are coming that have been uh, released. You can also send us a message there as to um, what you think about the show, what you'd like to see, what you think we could change and do better. We always like to hear about that. And um, you can see us on Facebook, on Google+, on Twitter. You'll see links at the top of the website for that. We appreciate your patronage and being with us and your encouragement that we get and when you do encourage us by giving us a plus one on Google Plus or a like or a share on Facebook that's always not only encouraging to us but it helps uh, spread the word about the sport of ultra cycling the race across America and we doing it for that reason and with that we're going to say goodbye and see you in a little while. Bye-bye.